Aloha. Hello, I'm Kathy with a K, radio broadcaster in Honolulu. It just dawned on me the last time I saw DJ Static Monty in real life was maybe 2004. I had landed with a young man I was dating at the time. It was a layover in LAX, so I had a few hours. So I called one of my BFFs, just Kai. She and Monty met us at the airport, picked us up, and we went to the boardwalk, walked around, and just dropped us off back at the airport. But that was the last time I saw Monty, so it was great to get reconnected on social. He continues to live in California, and this is Hawaii social distancing with Monty, DJ Static. Hello. Hello, Monty. It's Kathy with a K. Hey, Kathy. Hi. I'm super good. I can't believe I got you on the phone. May I have your permission to record this call? Oh, yes. Okay. I don't know if you're doing (laughs) (laughs) tie-dye. Yeah, none of that today. It's too rainy. Wow, this is so wild. It's so good to hear your voice. <laughs> I know, I was thinking the same thing. Is there any, anything coming from my side? No, your side, it sounds really good. It's it's my phone. This production board has been in here since KSSK was on Dillingham. So they had oh, wow. one for the AM studio, Perry and Price. So when they were working together there, it was used to be AM 590. And then they have another board, identical one, that would be in the 92.3 FM studio. And so when they moved here, when they got all these stations under one roof in Ivole, in Honolulu, the board I'm using is a production board. I think Cliff Richards, uh, who was the production man back yeah. in the day, he was doing it. And then yeah. Rebecca Inemoto Penny was on this board. And now I'm using this board primarily for the production uh. studio. I'm not even going to to try to strive for their greatness. I'm just using that same board. You know? <laughs> is it a Soundcraft? It is. What is it called? Oh, let me. It's an AMX22 Pacific Recorders and Engineering Corporation uh, setup. So weird. Our engineer Dale Machado. He has. Uh, I guess it goes on messaging boards and things to get different pieces. So they don't make this anymore and Dale's yeah, background yeah. is like he can understand like the circuitry and stuff so Monty yeah. DJ static rude funk your name has been popping up uh, today is April 7th 2020 Aloha Tuesday it is 1 10 p.m. in Hawaii and since we spring forward it is 4 10 in the afternoon where you are in California yes, it is. okay so what part of California are you living since you moved from Honolulu to California been in the northeast area of Hollywood, kind of Hollywood, northeast LA. Well, Silver Lake was where I lived for about 18 years, and then recently I've been staying in Glassville Park, which is even more east, a little bit more. Kind of by Occidental College, where Obama went to college at, one of his first colleges, it's right down the street, Eagle Rock, uh, Glendale, is right around the whole area. I came to LA for work. I had a, a production deal with a record label, and I just kind of got stuck here. The east side was very quiet, and nobody even knew where it was. I actually got lost in the northeast area. I just drove down Sunset, took a turn, and I couldn't get out of this little area. And I saw a for rent sign. That's where I ended up living for a long, long, long time. Rent was super cheap. It was back in '98. It was 575 in a modern building, central air, all the amenities, underground parking, and it was an unbelievable price. That same unit right now is about two thousand dollars. I just changed and. Little Silver Lake. One of the first neighborhoods that was getting a lot of media love about gentrification. It was like a little community of musicians and writers. It's where the first Disney studio was. And so there was a lot of the neighborhood was was really quiet and we all kind of just helped each other. There was a lot of musicians and bands and whether you were a, a rapper or a DJ, kind of co-opted and did, did things together. And then it just kind of built it and built it and just got gigantic. The internet and streaming and YouTube productions and then everybody started moving there and it just really gentrified the area all the way down to Echo Park and to downtown. It's so different compared to what I first saw uh, when we first moved to L.A. It changed a lot. So just to give a little backstory about DJ Static Monty, he and I both worked together at a radio station in the early 1990s in Waipahu, Radio Free Hawaii, and he did mixes and production and also some graphic artwork. Most of the artwork was stuff because I was co-promoting or I was a part of bringing the group through either Golden Voice or Matthew Graham when, when I first met him. 
we had to do stuff ourselves because we didn't have. And then Brian Miyazota was the one who actually, I would sit next to him and he did everything on the computer, which is DJ Evil. I've known him through that little network. Him and Alan Thurman were the main guys. They had this magazine called Deep Magazine. So I was really interested in going into early Photoshop. They were the guys who did all the work. I just was trying to pull in, you know, Rick Van Satin, Kevin Lyman, all those guys are starting to come around because Matt Graham did a, a show with them. So he brought the first Golden Boy shows and Pink's Garage and Pink Cadillac and all these little things that I knew the owners. So I was just there for all that. It was just like, let's get this going and make these events happen. So I was kind of behind the scenes. My interest as a DJ from a young guy in Hawaii, early Hawaii, uh, as far as like, for DJ culture was in the early, mid-80s. I brought all that knowledge from selling another business. Yeah, I just got into the music scene in Hawaii. It was, it was there for, the, for to get involved. There was so many people that were like, what is this going on? And I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. That's where I got involved with all that kind of stuff. All the people that I met either working at uh, Jelly's the Music Store at 404P Koi for myself and then going to the radio station seemed like everybody came from the country and then kind of, you know, stayed country by working in Waipahu at the radio station. What was your introduction into the Radio Free Hawaii fam? Oh, man, I was doing shows around Matthew Grimm and I was one of the Grimm brothers. It was this little production company and started doing shows and raves and stuff. I was just out of- as one of the Grim Brothers, I met him. I had a scooter shop in Kapahulu, and he was one of my customers. And I was a young guy. I had a little scooter shop. I had already gotten out of DJing from the 80s. They come to one of my events, and he had a flyer. And then so I started getting around him. And that kind of transported me into meeting another person, which was Guy Brand. Who was, everybody knows him as Guy Brand now. He had a little store in Jellies with animals ate them. For me, doing stuff with Matthew in the club and stuff, he knew I kind of knew about the music scene. And so he asked me, he gave me this sheet, and he says, can you start ordering for me, and I'll pay you a percentage or whatever you order for animals ate them. So I started looking through the DJ list. I can do this. So I started buying records for Jellies, and animals ate them, and he had this new store called Funk Pistol. And so that was a whole side that I knew about from my early days of, of you know, interested in, in hip hop records and dance records in general. So I got involved in that, and that kind of just grew it, our friendship and relationship. Got me back into DJing in the early 90s. It was something I had left in the 80s because I couldn't make any money. So I got into scooters and mopeds and had my little shop. When I got involved with Guy, it was he had an Animals Ate Them show. So the Animals Ate Them show, we used to do on the weekends. It was an hour show. It was super silly, but it featured a lot of music from the Animals Ate Them music collection that he had at the store. And, you know, coming on Radio Free early on, was we would give Norm rides back to the radio station, and I would always write these little notes on had him Norm in the car. And I'd ask him, can I have a show? Can I have a show? <laughs> I want to play records on the radio. And he thought it was the funniest thing. And, he, you know, it, it would, time went by, time went by, and Animals ate them. Actually, he stopped doing the show for whatever reason. And I got more involved in nightclubs, and I built a, a little nightclub called My Favorite Eggplant. That was after I did another one. It was called Zone 24. It was a couple places that I built, put up the lighting, painted the place. They just handed me the keys to these warehouses, and I built these DJ booths and lighting equipment. Eventually going to start DJing again. So I started DJing at the eggplant getting to know everybody and befriending so many really cool people, kind of like what happened to me here in the past in Silver Lake. Just meeting everybody. Then one time I asked Norm, and he says, we'll put you on a ballot. You have to get your voted in. And so it's like really nervous for me, you know, after DJing all these nightclubs and see if anybody even knew who I was or if I could actually add to the station. So then he asked me, we'll put you on a ballot and see what they say. And then people voted me on, and it was history from there. Kept going and kept going. It's a good thing my mic was off because that whole time you're talking, I'm like, you kidding me? What? How, when did that happen? <laughs> yeah, I did a lot of stuff. A lot of people, it just was, it happened so quickly. I mean, the, the time flew within six years, seven years. We did so much stuff in Hawaii. It just nonstop. Born in Hawaii or did you move to Hawaii? I was born in Maryland. My mother was from Germany. She was in Germany. We met my father in Germany. He was a soldier. And they moved to California. And at a really young age, they got separated and and she's like, I'm going to go someplace else. And my aunt happened to live here. They were living in Catlin Park by the airport. That's where it started around 
78, I would say. I was there from a little kid time, and my first elementary school was Pearl Harbor Elementary. Grew up in Salt Lake and Aleamano, and back and forth between there, Juan Law Intermediate, Juan Law High School, and then I left early in high school because I already had a business when I was very young. Yeah, so I was, I've been around the South Side for a while, late 70s. So I grew up around, so I got to learn the culture in a really wonderful time. It was still where you go to school, I was Hawaiiana, and I was a kid that didn't know about none of this stuff. It was early adapted and had a lot of Hawaiian families that I got befriended and lived around that brought me in, you know, put me under their wing, real grateful for. Who were some of the folks that you would uh, DJ with? Because whenever I think about you, it's mostly independent. Who would you uh, normally spin with? You know, it was a thing where I had the opportunity to be around a lot of people. So I kind of brought people around me or they came to me and they wanted an outlet to spin. Oh, gosh, there were so many people that were young DJs up and coming. One of them I can remember when I was doing these little events was uh, DJ Tell and he would show up with like five or six records of his favorite records and it was stuff that I didn't play because I mostly played instrumentals and some weird, just weirdo hip-hop music that nobody even heard of. Drama XL and uh, people that I oh, just started meeting them and they started coming around even before I had the radio show and it was one of them was I was working in customs as a job I had when it was a kind of a downtime in Hawaii so I, I took a job at, at working as a sky cap in customs and I met a guy who spoke Japanese and um, he was DJ Asia. Asia and me worked at the same place. I'm like, you got to meet all these guys I'm DJing with. I DJ at Pink Cadillac at the time, too, at nighttime as I was working at the airport. So it was like bringing people together. DJ Min he was at a Funk Dubious concert. He saw my car was full of turntables and equipment, and they're all looking at my car. And I was like, hey, what's up with you guys? Why are you looking at my car? Get away from my car. There was a few other people. I had this little click. And it, we were working on music from the early 90s, and it was the keyboard and some turntables. We were making beats, and we made the music for Pop Funk Pistol for their commercials. We had our own little loop funk click, is what we would call ourselves, and it was Sweepy. He's in the Rocksteady crew, and he's an actor and dancer. He travels and teaches with dance. Stan, One Night Stan, he was a, one of my favorite rappers from the neighborhood, Salt Lake. We got together, and we, we, it was kind of like Matt trying to be a, as a crew. Everybody developed crews after that with Sub-Zero was around and Grant was around and they started their song group. So we all had a really friendly vibe. We didn't know what was going on, where it was going to take us, how long it was going to go. So surprisingly, from the outside looking in now, it's like seeing everybody's really happy. They have family, way more involved in music than I am. For the love of it, being on an island, that's what you have. And I give them so much credit. All those guys that I spoke of, Probably a lot more than I'm forgetting. Of course, Daniel J. He was a major influence and actually you know, one of the first people to open the door to his studio. He had a couple of recording studios, and I'd be in there like recording your studio. And he'd be like, okay, you got a couple hours. You can, you can play around with your keyboard in here. And he was super supportive. And then he was DJing at Pink Cadillac, and I was using that Pink Cadillac. So it was like a, a history of back and forth. You know, I looked up to him because he had all the ins and outs of DJing in nightclubs, and I could only learn from him. Yeah, he's probably one of the bigger influences I've known him. So in Hawaii, March 25th or so, 2020, Governor David Ige had put in place the stay-at-home, work-at-home, essential workers, essential businesses and activities. And so it's been since then that a large part of the workforce has either been re working remotely, filing for unemployment. Traffic has just been really easy to get to and from places. Today, April 7th, 2020, HPD is really going to enforce non-essential activity like doing citations and possible arrests. They just want to make sure to stop and slow the coronavirus COVID-19 here in our islands. How has it been in your current neighborhood in California? I have an online business. So I, I pretty much live isolated for like the last five years. For health reasons, I started selling stuff online and working having trucking companies bring me stuff. I started noticing, I would say around February, really slowing down. So I got kind of cautious and I stopped buying and I didn't feel right because I sell to all over the world with certain products. I was like, okay, I'm going to have to get a backup just in case this goes bad. Got a job, went online, ended up with Amazon to work at Whole Foods as a shopper. It let me in, so I started having to go to the stores for training. Seen it from where 
was really lax. No one even wearing gloves. The doors were open. But there was this thing around us that we knew that was people were starting to get sick around the world. Just to see it build and how long it took for cities to actually take it seriously. Glove cleaning crew or all the, you know, the cash registers. Somebody was constantly walking around. It's up until, I would say, about two or three weeks. They took it very seriously. And at the same time, I also did a backup job for that, which I signed up for Target for inbounding, bringing, unloading, night shift to bring in stuff so much. Oh, I got this down. Started wearing masks. The LA's doing a pretty good job at it. I think if it would have been done a lot sooner, we don't know what was happening. Teams just started getting shut down. So I started noticing it. I, I, I think where it is now is a lot better than where it was. I'm still a customer at Target. I'm still at Whole Foods. And I go to the store. So I respect the, where they're at now. But I really wish they would have had something in place a lot sooner. How much longer is California going to be on a stay-at-home, work-at-home? Is it ending on April 30th, or is California kind of rolling it out a little bit further than that? I believe it is in April. The the mayor is really cautious about rushing it. He's someone that is having steps with the the police, with groups that are large groups that are hanging out together and having the police separate them in the neighborhood with close lives or reports. So spread it out and let people know, look, the police are going to say something to you if you are not and attention you should get home. The air quality in L.A. is amazing. I'm looking at these reports, and I'm like, wow, it hasn't been like this in almost 100 years. You know, the air quality is actually good and clean, and you can go outside and have a nice fresh air instead of just smog and smell and less pollution. Well, I'm going to cut off this recording portion and then catch up with you off mic. Thank you so much, DJ Static, Rude Funk, Monty, for getting me caught up by what's happening in California. Definitely have to do a true catch up in a minute. So good. Thank you, boy. Thank you.